The next day's march brought us to the celebrated city of Salamanca. Our entrance into this city was attended with great excitement. It was the goal for which we started from Quelu's camp, and whenever any unpleasant circumstance occurred during the march, Salamanca was loudly vociferated by every lip to cheer us on. Here it was that we expected to join the main body of our cavalry and artillery, who in consequence of the impracticability of moving them by any other road, were, with four regiments of infantry, the whole amounting to about 6,000 men, marched through Alentejo and Spanish Estremadura under the command of Sir John Hope. In this place we were in the immediate neighbourhood of foes, with whom we so ardently desired to measure swords. The ardour was equal on either side. The French, flushed with recent victories obtained in Italy, Germany and Spain, felt anxious to display their vaunted prowess, national flexibility in manoeuvre and tactical experience gained by all, enabling each individual to act independently when deemed necessary. The British, on the other hand, with full confidence in the result whenever they came in contact with their old foes, were desirous to prove that though partially broken, they never would bend. And, proud of their ignorance of trifling detail and spurning individual self-sufficiency, were always determined to fight to the last on the ground where they stood. They restrained even their natural tendency to rush forward from a full confidence in the judgment of their general, who would move them at the right moment. At length, Sir John Hope arrived at Alba de Tormes within a few leagues of us on December 5th. We were now in active preparation for a march, but whether to be led back to Portugal or forward to Valladolid, not a soul in the army could tell. All our movements depended on the information received from the Spaniards, which to a tittle always proved to be false. And if we had been guided by it, although it frequently passed through official English authorities, the British forces in Spain must have been lost. The army now underwent a partial remodelling. A corps of reserve were formed, composed of select troops. They consisted of the 20th, 28th, 52nd, 91st and 95th Rifles Regiments. The 20th and 52nd Regiments formed the 1st Brigade, commanded by General Anstruther. The 2nd Brigade consisted of the 28th, 91st and 95th Regiments, commanded by General Disney. The whole were under the orders of General Paget. All being prepared for a move, the British army commenced their advance from Salamanca on December 11th, with intention of marching direct to Valladolid. But on the arrival at headquarters at Alejos, on the 13th, an intercepted dispatch from the Prince of Neufchatel to the Duke of Dalmatia was brought to the general. These dispatches were of such a nature as to induce our general to deviate somewhat from the route intended. Leaving Valladolid more to our right, our headquarters were removed to Toro. On the night of the 14th, General Charles Stuart, with a detachment of the 18th Dragoons, surprised a detachment of the enemy, consisting of 50 infantry and 30 cavalry, cutting down or taking prisoners almost all of them. One dragoon who escaped carried the report of the destruction of the detachment and was scarcely credited by General Franceschi, who commanded about 400 cavalry at Valladolid. For previous to this surprise, the French were fortunately in total ignorance of our vicinity, reasonably concluding that by all the rules of war we were in full retreat towards Portugal. The reserve, in the meantime, arrived at Toro, where the advanced guard of General Baird's corps consisting of the cavalry under the command of Lord Paget, joined Sir John Moore's army. It now being evident that after the surprise of their outpost at Rueda, the enemy could no longer be ignorant of our advanced movements, Sir John Moore pushed on his columns as fast as the severity of the weather would permit. On the 16th, the reserve were at Puebla, on the 17th at Villapando. On the 18th headquarters were at Castro Nuevo. On the 19th, the reserve continued their march, and on the 20th reached Santarbas. On this day, the whole of the army were united 
and so far concentrated as shelter and deep snow would permit. The weather was excessively severe, and the flat, bleak country could furnish but little fuel. Lord Paget, being informed that General de Belle, with from six to seven hundred dragoons, was in the town of Sahagun, marched on the night of the 20th with the 10th and 15th Hussars from the different small villages where they were posted in front of the army at Mayorga. The 10th marched directly for the town, and the 15th led by Lord Paget endeavoured to turn it by the right and thus cut off the enemy's retreat. But his advance was unfortunately discovered by a patrol, and the French had time to form on the outside of the town before the 15th could get round. When, therefore, his lordship arrived at the rear of the town about daybreak, with four hundred of the fifteenth, the tenth not being as yet come up, he discovered a line of six hundred cavalry in a field close to the town and prepared to oppose him. They were drawn up in rear of a ravine which protected their front from being charged. But in those days, the superior numbers or strength of position of the French cavalry had very little influence over our dragoons. After manoeuvring a very short time, each party endeavouring to gain the flank of their opponent, Lord Paget charged with his wonted vigour, broke the enemy's line, and chased them off the field. The result of this gallant affair was a loss on the enemy's side of twenty men killed, two lieutenant colonels, eleven other officers, and one hundred and fifty troopers prisoners while the loss on our side amounted only to six men killed and from fifteen to twenty wounded. Continuing our advance, headquarters were established at Sahagun on the 21st, and on the same day the reserve marched to Grajal del Campo. In our present cantonments, the British army were within a day's march of the enemy posted at Saldanya and along the Carrion. Such close neighbourhood braced every nerve for deeds of arms. Our thoughts, which heretofore dwelt upon the sparkling eyes, beautiful faces and splendid figures of the Spanish fair, were now totally engrossed by the veteran soldiers of Napoleon. Love yielded to war, yet the flame which animated our breasts remained, its ardour ever increasing as the object in view became more glorious. On the 22nd, the whole army halted to refresh the troops, to put the guns in proper order, and, what was of still greater consequence, to repair the men's shoes, which were seriously damaged during our eleven days' march over rugged roads covered with frost and snow. Our reserve supplies had not yet come up. These preparations were diligently carried on during the day and early part of the ensuing night, it being intended that on the next day we should march against the enemy. The commander of the forces, however, calculated that by commencing his march in the morning, we should approach the enemy early enough to be discovered, but too late to attack, and that consequently we should be compelled to halt in the snow until daybreak enabled us to see what we had to do. A night attack may perhaps succeed, but the exact position of the party to be assaulted must be thoroughly ascertained previous to making the attack. We possessed no such information. No two reports ever agreed as to the enemy's position or strength. For these reasons, the march of the troops was deferred until the evening. Marching during the night, however severe the weather, was far preferable to a freezing halt in the snow, and the men would be in much better plight to attack the enemy at daybreak on the morning of the 24th. And in fact, no time would be lost, for had we marched on the morning of the 23rd instead of the evening, still the attack could not have taken place before the morning of the 24th. In pursuance of this plan, orders were received at Grajal del Campo early on the morning of the 23rd directing that the reserve should march that evening on the road towards the Carrion, indicating the point of junction with the rest of the army and their halt until the headquarters should arrive. On receipt of these instructions, General Paget used every endeavour to induce the men to lie down and take repose, exhorting the officers to keep the soldiers as much as possible in their billets, but, without issuing any orders on the subject, 
to tell them that the general's anxiety arose in consequence of a long march which was to take place that night. We, the reserve, therefore moved forward that evening, about four o'clock from Grajal del Campo, in light marching order, on our way towards the Carrion. After proceeding some hours, we halted not long after dark. The whole country was deeply covered with snow, and the sprightly national carols customary on the approach of Christmas were changed for a cold and silent night march to meet our national foes. Yet no hearts ever beat lighter in the social enjoyment of the former than ours did at what we confidently anticipated would be the result of the latter. But cruel necessity required that we should be grievously disappointed. After our halt, which took place at the point destined for our junction with the other column, had continued for two hours, conjecture became various as to the cause of their delay. We were first told that it was to give the artillery, which rolled heavily over the snow, time to come up. Subsequently, we were informed that the Marquis of Romana either mistook or willfully failed in his engagements to cooperate, and that the attack must consequently be postponed. Thenceforward, a hatred and contempt of the Spaniards in arms filled the breast of every British soldier. This feeling was renewed at Talavera and confirmed at Barossa, and for similar causes was kept alive so long as a British soldier remained in the peninsula. The report relative to Romana was not, however, in this instance strictly a fact, for he actually did move forward from Leon to Mansilla, with six or seven thousand half-starved and half-naked wretched troops, having previously left his artillery in the rear. The true cause of our halt and subsequent retreat was Sir John Moore having received information from Romana, as well as from others in whose accuracy he placed more reliance, that two hundred thousand enemies were put in motion against him. The British general that night commanded 23,000 men. Salt, within a day's march of his front, commanded 20,000 men. Napoleon, with 50,000 of the Imperial Guards marching, or rather flying from Madrid, was fast closing upon him and making rapid strides to cut off his only line of retreat. Thus he was placed in the immediate vicinity of 70,000 hardy veterans, more than triple his numbers. In this statement, Ney's corps are not included, although within two marches of Sault, with orders to press forward. Under such circumstances, there could be no hesitation how to act. A movement on Karuna was decided upon. The information just mentioned relative to the movements of the enemy against the British army was received at headquarters, Sahagun, about six o'clock in the evening of the 23rd, in time to enable the commander of the forces to countermand the forward march of the troops stationed there. But as it was too late to prevent the forward march of the reserve, orders were sent to the place intended as the point of rendezvous directing their return to Grajal del Campo, where we arrived on the morning of the 24th. There we halted the remainder of that day to get ready our heavy baggage, for we had moved in light marching order the previous night, and to give a day's start to the leading columns Sir David Baird's and General Hope's divisions, which had marched that morning, the former for Valencia, the latter towards Benevent. On the 25th, the reserve, accompanied by the light brigade and covered by the cavalry, marched under the immediate orders of Sir John Moore, and following the track of Hope's division, crossed the Esla by the bridge of Castro Gonzolo on the 27th. Thence we moved on to Benevent, distant about four miles. After passing Mayorga on the 26th, Lord Paget, with two squadrons of the 10th Hussars, charged a large detachment of the enemy's dragoons, strongly posted on a rising ground, and, notwithstanding the strength of their position and great superiority of numbers, he killed twenty and took a hundred prisoners. The destruction of the bridge having commenced, and to favour this arduous undertaking, as well as to cover the passage of the cavalry who had not as yet come up. General Robert Crawford, 
with the 2nd Light Brigade and two guns, took up a position on the left bank, which from its boldness commanded the bridge and both banks, being thus from necessity left on the enemy's side of the stream, the right bank flat and low offering, no vantage ground. The cavalry having crossed on the afternoon of the 27th, the destruction of the bridge commenced, which occupied half the light brigade until late on the night of the 28th, the other half being in constant skirmish with the advancing enemy. The bridge being constructed of such solid material, the greatest exertions were required to penetrate the masonry. And from the hurried manner and sudden necessity of the march from Sahagan, there had been no time to send an engineer forward to prepare for the undertaking. These circumstances much retarded the work, and an incessant fall of heavy rain and sleet rendered the whole operation excessively laborious and fatiguing. To add to this, Napoleon, having been informed of our movement towards Valladolid, was determined to crush us for daring to advance, while Salt, now aware of our retiring, was resolved to punish us, elate at our not having previously punished him, which we most certainly should have done on Christmas Eve had it not been for the astounding information received by Sir John Moore late on the evening of the 23rd, to the effect that his little army were then the focus upon which 200,000 French troops were directing their hasty strides. Those two consummate generals, Napoleon and Soult, pushed on their advanced guards with such celerity that Soult's light troops and the chasses of the Imperial Guard came in sight whilst our rear guard were crossing the Esla. During the evening of the 27th and the whole of the 28th, continued skirmishes took place in the vicinity of the bridge, and the enemy kept up a desultory fire along the banks. The imperial chasseurs, flushed with the capture of a few women and stragglers, whom they picked up in the plain, had the hardihood more than once to gallop up close to the bridge, with the intention no doubt of disturbing the men employed there, but they always retired with increased celerity leaving not a few behind to serve as a warning off to others. On the night of the 28th, the preparations at the bridge being completed, the troops retired. Fortunately, it was dark, rainy and tempestuous. And so, the light brigade passed unobserved over the bridge to the friendly side in profound silence, except for the roaring of the waters and the tempest, and without the slightest opposition. Immediately on our gaining the right bank, the mine was sprung with fullest effect, blowing up two arches, together with the buttress by which they had been supported, and awakening the French to a sense of their shameful want of vigilance and enterprise. Had they kept a strict watch, and risked an assault during the passage, which they would have been fully borne out in doing from the number of their troops already in the plain, and which were hourly increasing, the light division would have been perilously situated, for Crowford had passed over the guns some time previously, and had immediately after cut one of the arches completely through, so that the men were obliged to cross over a narrow strip formed of planks not very firmly laid, while the impetuous torrent, now swollen above its banks from the constant heavy rain and snow, roaring rather through than beneath the bridge, threatened to carry away both men and planks. All being thus happily terminated, the troops moved into Benevent. But Crowford's brigade was so excessively fatigued, having worked incessantly and laboured severely for nearly two days and two nights, their clothes drenched through the whole time, that they could scarcely keep their eyes open. There was now a large force suddenly collected in Benevente which under any circumstances causes much confusion. But more particularly at that moment, when our chief employment was the destruction of stores. Nevertheless, the duty was performed with extraordinary forbearance on the part of the men, particularly when it is considered that the Spanish authorities, either from disinclination to serve the British, or from a dread of the enemy, who, as they knew, must occupy the town in a very short time, took no car whatever to supply our troops regularly with provisions, or indeed with anything which we required. The same feelings pervaded all ranks of the inhabitants, 
and although with payment in our hands we sought for bread, wine and animals to convey our baggage, yet nothing could be procured. The magistrates either hid themselves or retired. The inhabitants denied everything of which we stood most in need, and whilst all the shops were open in Madrid and in all other towns through which the French army passed, or which they held, every door was shut against the British army. It seldom fell to the lot of the reserve to sleep in a house during the movement to Corona, but in those which we passed whilst marching along, every article of food was hid with which the enemy were subsequently supplied in abundance. And in no part of Spain was this want of good feeling towards the British more apparent than in Benevent, a specimen of which will be seen in the following anecdote. After the destruction of Gonzalo Bridge, when the 52nd Regiment marched into Benevente, though benumbed with wet and cold, yet they could not procure a single pint of wine for the men, either for love or money, or for mere humanity which under such circumstances would have moved the breast of most men to an act of charitable generosity. During the anxious pleading to the feelings and the dogged denial, a sergeant of his company came to Lieutenant Love of the above-mentioned regiment, informing him that in an outhouse belonging to the convent in which they were billeted, he discovered a wall recently built up by which he conjectured that some wine might have been concealed. Love instantly waited on the friars, whom he entreated to let the men have some wine, at the same time offering prompt payment. The holy fat father abbot constantly declared, by a long catalogue of saints, that there was not a drop in the convent. Love, although a very young man at the time, was not easily imposed upon. Reconnoitring the premises, he had a rope tied round his body, and in this manner got himself lowered through a sort of skylight down into the outhouse, where the sergeant had discovered the fresh masonry through a crevice in the strongly barricaded door. After his landing, the rope was drawn up, and two men of the company followed in the same manner. They fortunately found a log of wood, which, aided by the ropes, they converted into a battering ram, and four or five strong percussions well directed breached the newly built wall. Now rushing through the breach, they found the inner chamber to be the very sanctum sanctorum of Bacchus. Wine sufficient was found to give every man in the company a generous allowance. The racy juice was contained in a large vat, and while they were issuing it out in perfect order to the drenched and shivering soldiers, the fat prior suddenly made his appearance through a trapdoor and laughingly requested that at least he might have one drink before all was consumed. Upon this one of the men remarked, By Jove, when the wine was his, he was damn stingy about it, but now that it is ours, we will show him what British hospitality is and give him his fill. So saying, he seized the holy fat man and chucked him head foremost into the vat, and had it not been for love and some other officers, who by this time had found their way into the cellar, the Franciscan worshipper of Bacchus would most probably have shared the fate of George Duke of Clarence, except that the wine was not Malmsey. This anecdote was told to me at the time by some officers of the 52nd. Then it was I had the pleasure of first making the acquaintance of Lieutenant Calvert of that regiment, long since Lieutenant Colonel. This acquaintance was afterwards renewed under no ordinary circumstances at the Battle of Barossa. The anecdote was many years later confirmed by Love himself in the island of Zante, where in 1836 he was quartered with the 73rd Regiment, of which he was Lieutenant Colonel at the time when I was writing these memoirs. I read him the whole of these memoirs and found his recollection of the campaign very interesting. The dates of his commissions and mine in the respective ranks of Ensign, Lieutenant and Captain were within a few months of each other, but he became Lieutenant Colonel long before I retired from the service still as Captain. Yet he was an old soldier at the time, and if gallant conduct on all occasions, which offered during a long career, devoted attachment to his profession and ardent zeal to promote its honour and glory, can give a claim to advancement by none was it better merited. 
the only extraordinary circumstance attending his promotion was that he obtained it through personal merit. On the 28th, the divisions of Generals Hope and Fraser moved out of Benevente for Astorga. The reserve and light brigade remained until the 29th. On that morning, the enemy's cavalry, commanded by Napoleon's favourite general, Lefebvre Denouets, forded the Isla, and as they were taken for the advance of a large force, the reserve and light brigades were ordered instantly to retire on the road leading to Astorga. Although General Stuart, who took command of our cavalry piquets, a gallantly resisted Lefebvre, and every step was met with a blow, yet the French general sternly moved forward along the plain which skirted Benevent. Lord Paget, who viewed from a distance what passed at the extremity of the plain, in courtesy allowed the French general to advance until it became too dangerous for his troops to proceed farther. Then, at the head of the Tenth Hussars, whom he had previously formed under cover of some houses, he rode furiously at the enemy, who, wheeling round, were pursued into the very bed of the Essler, where many a deadly blow was dealt, and it was shown once again that British steel was not to be resisted when wielded by British soldiers determined to vindicate the superiority of their national productions. On gaining the opposite bank of the river, the enemy immediately formed on rising ground which overlooked the stream and displayed symptoms of returning to the fight. But our artillery, having interfered with some well-directed shrapnel shots, the foe retired in disgust and pride, leaving their gallant and accomplished general behind to refine our manners, if not our steel. On his arrival in England, he was sent to Bath, where he showed with what facility a Frenchman can insinuate himself into society as a man of spirit and gallantry. Whilst our guns continued to fire upon the retreating enemy, the rear guard of the reserve were evacuating Benevent. During our march, we were passed on the road by 70 or 80 dragoons of the Imperial Guard, together with their leader, General Lefebvre, who were made prisoners in the affair of the morning. The general looked fierce and bloody from a wound which he received across the forehead while gallantly defending himself in the stream wherein he was taken. In this affair, our dragoons suffered a loss of fifty men, killed and wounded. The French left fifty-five killed and wounded on the field, and seventy officers and men prisoners, together with their general. It cannot be said that there was any disparity of force, for although in the commencement of the affair the French were far more numerous, yet towards the close, the reversi was the casey. We arrived at Labaneza that night, and next day marched into Astorga. Here we were crossed by the ragged, half-starved corps of Spaniards under the partial control of the Marquis of Romana, which circumstance not a little astonished us, as the Marquis repeatedly promised Sir John Moore that he would retire into the Asturias. This unexpected interruption to our march was attended with the most serious consequences to our army and from it may be dated the straggling which soon commenced. The Spaniards, shivering from partial nakedness and voracious from continued hunger, committed the greatest disorders in search of food and raiment. Their bad example was eagerly followed by the British soldiers in their insatiable thirst for wine, and all the exertions, even of the commander of the forces personally, were not of much avail. We could not destroy the stores, which had to be abandoned. The civil authorities rather impeded than assisted us in procuring the means of transport, nor could rations be regularly served out to the men sufficient for a two days' march. The troops of the two nations seemed envious of each other, lest the depredations of one should give it what they in their blind excesses considered an advantage over the other. They prowled about the town the greater part of the night and when they attempted to take repose, there arose a contention for choice of quarters, so that our march was commenced next morning, without the men having taken useful nourishment or necessary repose. It was on that night which we passed at Astorga that I discovered a circumstance of which 
I had not been previously aware, namely, that in the light company of the 28th Regiment, there was a complete and well-organized band of ventriloquists who could imitate any species of bird or animal so perfectly that it was scarcely possible to discover the difference between the imitation and the natural tone of the animal imitated. Soon after we contrived to get into some kind of a quarter, the men being in the same apartment with the officers owing to the crowd and confusion, a soldier named Savage, immediately on entering the room, began to crow like a cock, and then placed his ear close to the keyhole of a door leading into another apartment, which was locked. After remaining in this attentive position for some moments, he removed to another part of the room and repeated his crowing. I began to think that the man was drunk or insane, never before having perceived in him the slightest want of proper respect for his superiors. Upon my asking him what he meant by such extraordinary conduct in the presence of his officers, he, with a smile, replied, I believe we have them, sir. This seemingly unconnected reply confirmed me in the opinion I had formed of his mental derangement, the more particularly as his incoherent reply was instantly followed by another crow. This was answered apparently in the same voice, but somewhat fainter. Savage then jumped up, crying out, Here they are, and insisted upon having the door opened. And when this was reluctantly done by the inhabitants of the house, a fine cock followed by many hens came strutting into the room with all the pomp of a sultan attended by his many queens. The head of the polygamist, together with those of his superfluous wives, was soon severed from his body, notwithstanding the loud remonstrances of the former owners, who, failing in their entreaties that the harem should be spared, demanded remuneration. But whether the men paid for what they had taken like grovelling citizens, or offered political reasons as an apology like great monarchs, I now cannot call to mind. But however, the affair may have been arranged, the act was venial, for had the fowls been spared by our men, they must have fallen into the stomachs of our enemies next day. And it is not one of the least important duties of a retreating army to carry away or destroy anything which may be useful to their pursuers, however severely the inhabitants may suffer. During the night I was awakened by the ventriloquists, who with appropriate harmony were loudly bleating, cackling, crowing, cooing, lowing, in fact imitating every species of animal, so that at the moment I awoke I fancied myself in an extensive menagerie. Indeed the powerful effect of their music on many occasions during the retreat came to my knowledge, and so judiciously did they exert their talents that animals of all descriptions came frisking to their feet, offering a practical elucidation of the powers attributed to Orpheus when round him danced the brutes. On the last day of 1808, we marched from Astorga with more headaches than full stomachs, and the light brigade, having moved on the route to Vigo, the rear guard fell exclusively to the reserve during the remainder of the retreat. The distance we had to move on that day being short, we continued until late to destroy stores and such field equipments as, for want of animals, could not be carried away and after eight or nine miles' march, we arrived in the evening at a small village called Cambaros. At this place our evil genius, the Spaniards, again crossed us, and the scenes at Astorga were partially renewed. But as only the sick and stragglers of the Spanish army were there, the contention was but little. In fact, their miserable and forlorn condition called forth compassion rather than other sentiments. Two or three cartloads of them being put down at an outhouse where I was on piquet with the light company, we took them in. Such misery I never beheld, half naked, half starved, and deprived of both medicine and medical attendance. We administered a little of our general cordial, rum. Yet three or four of these wretches expired that night close to a large fire which we lit in the middle of the floor. Our stay at Cambaros 
was but short, for scarcely had the men laid down to repose, which was much wanted in consequence of the manner in which they had passed the previous night, when some of our cavalry came galloping in, reporting that the enemy were advancing in force. We were immediately ordered to get under arms and hurried to form outside the town on that part facing Bembibre. While we were forming a dragoon rode up, and an officer, who being ill was in one of the light carts which attended the reserve, cried out, Dragoon, what news? News, sir. The only news I have for you is that unless you step out like soldiers and don't wait to pick your steps like bucks in Bond Street of a Sunday with shoes and silk stockings, damn it, you'll be all taken prisoners. Pray, who the devil are you? came from the cart. I am Lord Paget, said the dragoon, and pray, sir, may I ask who you are? I am the captain of the 28th Regiment, my lord. Come out of that cart directly, said his lordship. March with your men, sir, and keep up their spirits by showing them a good example. The captain scrambled out of the cart rear, face foremost, and from slipping along the side of the cart and off the wheels, and from the sudden jerks which he made to regain his equilibrium, displayed all the ridiculous motions of a galvanised frog. Although he had previously suffered a good deal from both fatigue and illness, yet the circumstance altogether caused the effect desired by his lordship, for the whole regiment were highly diverted by the scene until we arrived at Bembibre, and it caused many a hearty laugh during the remainder of the retreat. We arrived within a league of Bembibre at daybreak on the morning of January the 1st, 1809, and were there halted at a difficult pass in the mountains to cut the road. It appeared that some of the leading divisions had already commenced this work. Spades, pickaxes, and such tools were found on the spot. We had not continued long at this employment when we were ordered to desist, since Bembibre was turned by the Fonsevedon Road which joined that on which we were not far from Calcabelos, and so the work was considered useless. This order was received with the greatest joy. Indeed, there was no duty which we would not more willingly perform than that of handling the pickaxe, and that too during a severe frost and after a long night march. We therefore joyfully moved on to Bembibre. On approaching this village, we discovered Sir David Baird's division, who had just left and were proceeding on the road to Villa Franca. We now fully anticipated some repose, to which we thought ourselves entitled by our laborious occupation of destroying stores at Astorga the whole time we were there, and the long and severe night march which we had just terminated. But we were sadly disappointed. The leading columns, well aware of the value and necessity of vigilance, although it was shamefully neglected by themselves, left sufficient matter behind to prevent the reserve from sleeping too much. And when we entered the town of Bumbibre and expected to stretch our wearied limbs, we were ordered to pile arms and clear all the houses of the stragglers left behind. The scenes here presented can only be faintly imagined from the most faithful description which even the ablest writer could pen, but little, therefore, can be expected from any attempt of mine to paint the scandal here presented by the British troops or the degrading scenes exhibited through their debauchery. Bembibre exhibited all the appearance of a place lately stormed and pillaged. Every door and window was broken, every lock and fastening forced. Rivers of wine ran through the houses and into the streets, where lay fantastic groups of soldiers, many of them with their firelocks broken, women, children, runaway Spaniards and muleteers, all apparently inanimate, except when here and there a leg or arm was seen to move, while the wine oozing from their lips and nostrils seemed the effect of gunshot wounds. Every floor contained the worshippers of Bacchus, in all their different stages of devotion. Some lay senseless, others staggered. There were those who prepared the libation by boring holes with their bayonets into the large wine vats, regardless of the quantity which flowed through the cellars 
and was consequently destroyed. The music was perfectly in character. Savage roars announcing present hilarity were mingled with groans issuing from fevered lips disgorging the wine of yesterday. Obscenity was public sport. But these scenes are too disgusting to be dwelt upon. We were employed the greatest part of the day, January 1st, 1809, in turning or dragging the drunken stragglers out of the houses into the streets and sending as many forward as could be moved. Our occupation next morning was the same, yet little could be effected with men incapable of standing, much less of marching forward. At length, the cavalry reporting the near approach of the enemy, and Sir John Moore dreading lest Napoleon's columns should intersect our line of march by pushing along the Fonsevedon Road, which joined our road not many miles in front of us. The reserve were ordered forward, preceded by the cavalry, and the stragglers were left to their fate. Here I must say that our division, imbibing a good deal of the bad example and of the wine left behind by the preceding columns, did not march out of Bembibre so strong as when they entered it. We had proceeded but a short distance when the enemy's horsemen nearly approached the place, and then it was that the apparently lifeless stragglers, whom no exertion of ours was sufficient to rouse from their torpor, startled at the immediate approach of danger, found the partial use of their limbs. The road instantly became thronged by them. They reeled, staggered and screaming threw down their arms. Frantic women held forth their babies, suing for mercy by the cries of defenceless innocence. But all to no purpose. The dragoons of the polite and civilised nation advanced and cut right and left, regardless of intoxication, age or sex. Drunkards, women and children were indiscriminately hewn down, a dastardly revenge for their defeat at Benevent. But they dearly paid for their wanton cruelty when encountered next day at Calcabello's. The foe, rendered presumptuous by their easy victory, gained over the defenceless stragglers, rode so close to our columns that that distinguished officer, Colonel Ross, with his gallant 20th Regiment, was halted and placed in an ambush, formed by the winding of the road round the slope of a hill which concealed them until nearly approached. The remainder of the reserve marched on and halted at a considerable distance. But the French were overcautious, and after a lapse of more than an hour, during which time many wounded stragglers joined the main body of the division, Colonel Ross was recalled, much disappointed by the enemy's declining to advance. He reluctantly joined the main body of the reserve, who immediately moved forward. Thus, every means was used compatible with prudence to cover and protect the unworthy stragglers from Bembibre, and great risk was run, for we did not feel ourselves secure until we passed the junction of the roads mentioned, not knowing what force might be pushing forward along the Fonsebadon line. Continuing our march, at a rather accelerated pace until we passed the junction, we arrived at Calcabello's about an hour before dark. The commander of the forces, with the main body of the cavalry, had marched in the morning from Bembibre, and immediately on his arrival at Villa Franca, used every endeavour to remedy and quell the disorders committed there. The disgraceful conduct which took place at Astorga and Bembibre was here perpetrated by the preceding divisions. All the doors and windows were broken open, the stores robbed, and the commissaries so intimidated as to be prevented from making any careful distribution of the provisions. One of the stragglers left behind had the hardihood, although knowing that the commander of the forces was present, to break open and plunder a magazine in broad daylight. But being taken in the act, he was ordered to be executed and was shot in the marketplace. After using every exertion to restore order and discipline, the general returned to Calcabellos and met us just as we halted. We were immediately formed in contiguous close columns in a field by the road, when the commander of the forces rode up and addressed us in the most forcible and pathetic manner. After dwelling on the outrageous disorders and want of discipline in the army, he concluded by saying, 
and if the enemy are in possession of Bembibre, which I believe, they have got a rare prize. They have taken or cut to pieces many hundred drunken British cowards, for none but unprincipled cowards would get drunk in presence, nay, in the very sight of the enemies of their country, and sooner than survive the disgrace of such infamous misconduct, I hope that the first cannonball fired by the enemy may take me in the head. Then turning to us, he added, And you, twenty-eighth, are not what you used to be. You are not the regiment who to a man fought by my side in Egypt. If you were, no earthly temptation could even for an instant seduce one of you away from your colours. He then rode off and returned to Villafranca. This feeling and pungent address made a deep impression on every individual present, as well officers as men. But the feeling of remorse was but of short duration. Future temptations brought on future disorders. Immediately on the departure of the General-in-Chief, General Paget placed the reserve in position, giving us to understand that our not being lodged in the village arose not from any necessity strictly military, but that it was entirely owing to our own misconduct. After the disgraceful scenes presented at Bembebre, it was not considered safe to lodge the men in houses, more particularly as we could not tell at what hour, day or night the enemy's advancing columns might be upon us. A detachment of from 300 to 400 cavalry, the only ones left behind, together with about the same number of the 95th Regiment, were pushed forward about two miles upon the road leading to Bembibre to watch any enemy coming thence or from Fonsevedon. Late on this evening, General Paget issued an order strongly censuring our past conduct and stating that, although we committed fewer excesses and were guilty of fewer disorders than any other division of the army and consequently had fewer stragglers, yet we were unworthy the proud situation which we held and had forfeited the high honour conferred upon us when we were selected to lead into action and to cover the army when required. He added that every instance of drunkenness in the troops under present circumstances was compromising the honour of their country. But that drunkenness in the reserve was willfully betraying the lives of their comrades in arms and endangering the safety of the whole army. The reserve must be exemplary in their good conduct. Every soldier of which it is composed must consider himself at all times a sentinel at the post of danger, consequently at the post of honour. Orders were issued that no man was on any pretense whatever to enter the town without being accompanied by a non-commissioned officer who was held strictly responsible for the due return of those committed to his charge. Parties were ordered frequently to patrol the town during the night and make prisoners of any stragglers they should meet. Notwithstanding these orders, the moving appeal of General Paget and the severe reproof so deservedly called forth from the commander of the forces against the whole army, scarcely had darkness prevailed when stragglers from our position, with many who had escaped from Bembibre, continued their disorders and depredations principally against the wine vats. Many were taken during the night, breaking open doors and plundering cellars, and two men were seized in the act of committing a more serious crime, that of robbing the person of an inhabitant. Early on the morning of the third, the reserve marched up towards the crown of a low hill in front of Calcabello's on the Bembibre side. Here we halted, leaving so much of it above us as served to screen us from the view of an approaching foe. No enemy having as yet advanced, the General of Division ordered a hollow square to be formed, facing inwards. A drumhead court-martial sat in rear of every regiment, and within the square were placed the triangles. The culprits seized in the town, as soon as tried and sentenced, were tied up and a general punishment took place along the four faces of the square, and this continued for several hours. During this time, our vedettes came in frequently to report to the general that the enemy were advancing. His only reply was, Very well. 
the punishment went on. The two culprits whom I have mentioned as having been seized in the act of committing a robbery stood with ropes round their necks. Being conducted to an angle of the square, the ropes were fastened to the branches of a tree which stood there, and at the same time the delinquents were lifted up and held on the shoulders of persons attached to the provost marshal. In this situation, they remained awaiting the awful signal for execution, which would instantly be carried into effect by a mere movement from the tree of the men upon whose shoulders they were supported. At this time, between twelve and one o'clock, as well as I can remember, a cavalry officer of high regimental rank galloped into the square and reported to General Paget that the piquets were engaged and retiring. I am sorry for it, sir, said the general, but this information is of a nature which would induce me to expect a report rather by a private dragoon than from you. You had better go back to your fighting piquets, sir, and animate your men to a full discharge of their duty. General Paget was then silent for a few moments, and apparently suffering under great excitement. He at length addressed the square by saying, My God, is it not lamentable to think that instead of preparing the troops confided to my command to receive the enemies of their country, I am preparing to hang two robbers? But though that angle of the square should be attacked, I shall execute these villains in this angle. The general again became silent for a moment, and our piquets were heard retiring up the opposite side of the hill and along the road which flanked it on our left. After a moment's pause, he addressed the men a second time in these words. If I spare the lives of these two men, will you promise to reform? Not the slightest sound, not even breathing, was heard within the square. The question was repeated. If I spare the lives of these men, will you give me your word of honour as soldiers that you will reform? The same awful silence continued until some of the officers whispered to the men to say, yes, when that word loudly and rapidly flew through the square. The culprits were then hastily taken away from the fatal tree by a suspension from which they but a moment before expected to have terminated their existence. The triangles were now ordered to be taken down and carried away. Indeed, the whole affair had all the appearance of stage management, for even as the men gave the cheers customary when condemned criminals are reprieved, our piquets appeared on the summit of the hill above us, intermixed with the enemy's advanced guard. The square was immediately reduced, formed into columns at quarter distance and retired, preceded by the 52nd Regiment who started forward at double quick time, and, crossing the river Gaia, lined its opposite bank. The division coming up passed over the bridge, with the exception of the 28th Light Company, who were left behind with orders to remain there until the whole of the reserve should have crossed, and then to follow. General Paget now moved forward and took up a strong position on the side of a sloping hill immediately in front of Calcabelos. His extreme right somewhat outflanked the town. His left rested on the road leading to Villa Franca. The whole line was protected by a chain of hedges and stone walls, which ran close in front. Our battery of six guns was pushed some way down the road leading to the bridge to take advantage of a small bay by which they were protected and concealed from the enemy. The light company of the 28th as soon as they retired from the bridge, were to be posted immediately under the guns, which were to fire over our heads, the declivity of the road allowing that arrangement. The left wing of the 28th Regiment were pushed forward immediately in rear of the guns and for their protection. The right wing of the 28th Regiment now formed the extreme left of the direct line. Further in advance, and extended to the left along the bank of the stream, their right close to the bridge, the 52nd were placed. The Guia, an insignificant stream, but at this season rising in its bed, runs along the base of the sloping hill upon which Calcabellos is situated, at the distance of from four to five hundred yards, 
and passing under the narrow stone bridge, winds round the vineyards in which the 52nd Regiment were posted. At this bridge, the light company, as has been said, were posted until everything belonging to the reserve should pass over, and before this was entirely accomplished, our cavalry, at first preceded by the 95th, whom they passed through, came galloping down to the bridge, followed closely by the enemy's dragoons. The enemy's advance being seen from the high ground in our rear, the battalion bugles sounded our recall, but it was impossible to obey, for at that moment our cavalry and the rifles completely choked up the bridge. The situation of the light company was now very embarrassing, in danger of being trampled by our own cavalry, who rode over everything which came in their way, and crowded by the 95th and liable to be shot by them, for in their confusion they were firing in every direction. Some of them were a little the worse for liquor, a staggering complaint at that time very prevalent in our army. And we were so mixed up with them and our own cavalry that we could offer no formation to receive the enemy, who threatened to cut us down. At length, the crowd dissipating, we were plainly seen by the French, who, probably taking us for the head of an infantry column, retired. We sent them a few shots. As soon as the 95th, who had lost between 30 and 40 prisoners on the occasion, had crossed over and lined the hedges on the opposite side, and our cavalry, taking retrograde precedence more through horseplay than military etiquette, had cleared the bridge. The light company followed. It was mortifying to reflect that after such an uninterrupted series of brilliant achievements, their farewell encounter with their opponents should thus terminate, even although they may have been somewhat outnumbered. But neither of their two gallant leaders were present. The light company now occupied their destined post under the guns, and accounted for not having obeyed the battalion bugles, which had continued to sound the recall during the whole time of our absence. The cavalry rode on without a halt to join the main body, then on march for Lugo, 